So your hook for today is, how can you do a job if you don't have the strength to do it? For example, suppose I ask you to lift a piano onto the second floor of my house. And the answer to that hook is you would use a machine, which is the topic we're going for here. But here's a second hook. Machines don't actually do work for you. That you have to do all of the work. And in fact, if, if you use a machine, you will probably do more work than you would have done if you had not used a machine. So why would you use a machine? And the answer to that question is that machines make it easier. That is, less force, not less energy, not less work, but less force to get that work done. All right, first off, there are six simple machines and we'll play the game of can you, can you list them? You make that in a nice list on the vertical edge of your page there and then I'll pull this page away and, and, um, and you can add any machines that you left out uh, to the right. I'd like to see what list you came up with on your own and then, uh, but then you make a complete list. Um, and the first machine is an inclined plane or a ramp. The second machine, which is very like an inclined plane, is a wedge. The difference is that with an inclined plane, you pull the load up the machine. And in the case of the wedge, you move the machine into the load, that is, into the log that you're trying to split apart. The third is a screw, which is either a wedge or an inclined plane that has been spiraled about a shaft. And all of the, these three make a family of machines. And this is a family that involve an equilibrium of forces to get your advantage, to multiply your force. That uh, in the case of the inclined plane, um, imagine if this represented the weight of the piano, but I was incapable of supplying that much force to lift the piano up. If instead I pulled the piano up an inclined plane, I would only have to exert this much force, plus a little bit more for friction. But it would be less force than if I had lifted it without the machine. So you're getting this components to your advantage. An equilibrium of my force called the effort that I'm lifting it with and just this component here, plus possibly friction. The next machine is a lever, where you have a fulcrum or a pivot here. And very much like a lever, you would put the thing you're trying to lift here, and you would exert your effort out here. Um, very much like the lever is a wheel and axle. That, again, this rotates, and there would be the pivot. We wouldn't call it a fulcrum in this case. But imagine taking this and turning it very fast. This end of the stick here would map out a circle, and this end here would map out a circle, and it would look just like this. There's really no difference between wheel and axle and lever, but to get the list six along, we use that. Those two machines make the second family, where instead of an equilibrium of forces, you're doing an equilibrium of torques. This one is translational, these three. These two are rotational. And you get the advantage by a, with a longer arm. It takes less force, less effort, to produce the same torque. The last machine is called a pulley system, or we sometimes lazily just call it a pulley. But that single pulley there wouldn't get you any advantage. Um, but having the load hanging off this pulley down here means that I pull on this string. There's my effort. That creates a tension, which is the same throughout this rope. And so that tension acts twice on the load. And there's my advantage. Um, so, so this last one does not fit with the previous five. It is this matter of working with tensions.
machines do do work you have to put energy in and they give energy out and I think the best way to work with machines is to realize that you're getting work out of the machine and that's equal to the work that you put in times this factor which we call efficiency that is if I put a hundred joules in and I only got 50 joules of work out of the machine then we would say you had 50 percent efficiency work is going to be calculated by taking the force that the machine exerts and the distance that it exerts it through and that would be equal to the force that you put in and the distance that it acts through. Well we have a special name for the force that comes out of the machine we call that the load and the force that you put into the machine we call the effort which means that that we can do a very nice job with problems like what about if I had six newtons and I wanted to get this six newtons five meters up in the air but instead I'm going to pull it along this incline well the load is six newtons and the uh, distance that the load acts through is 5. The distance that the effort acts through is 30 and you can see that we could very easily then figure out what that effort would be. In this case it would just be 1 Newton. That I could raise 6 Newtons by only exerting 1 Newton of my own. But notice I would have to exert that 1 Newton through six times the distance and that would be only if the machine was 100 percent efficient. Um, so let's try this problem and, and uh, you answer it and again this machine is 100 percent efficient. And what about this one? Do this one assuming again that the machine is 100 percent efficient. And finally this one with the machine that is 100% efficient. But machines are not 100% efficient. Friction is going to be acting and robbing energy, turning it into useless heat, thermal energy. And so we come back to that original equation that I talked about, which we developed into this, and we have a quantity that we call mechanical advantage, which is the ratio of the load to the effort. Sometimes it's called AMA, actual mechanical advantage. But there is another quantity that we call ideal mechanical advantage, and that would be if your machine is 100% efficient. But if we come up here and you put in 100% efficiency there, then the ratio of the load to the effort, I would divide both sides of this by effort, is going to be the same as the ratio of the distance that the effort moves through divided by the distance that the load moves through. So there's a handy way to get at ideal mechanical advantage. And it is possible to then calculate the efficiency, which you can see by dividing these two terms into this over here, would be load over effort, which we call mechanical advantage, times the distance that the load goes through divided by the distance that the effort goes through or divided by the distance that the effort goes through divided by the distance that the load that is divided by the ideal mechanical advantage and you need to make efficiency is always reported as a uh, percentage so that would be a name for one that I would multiply it by. All right, now we have this one, and you are to calculate the efficiency. Good luck. New topic. Um, center of gravity is a term we give to the place where the force of gravity acts, that is, where the weight would send, send to be. So if you had an object like this, whose center of gravity was at that dot, then it is at that dot that we would say the weight, the force from the earth acts. 
But if you balance this on your finger, so that the normal force from your finger was here, and it wasn't collinear with the weight, I think you can see that those two non-collinear forces would give rise to a couple. And it would cause this thing, we'll draw it for you in orange, this thing would tend to twist around like this, that because of the couple there would be a torque, there would not be rotational equilibrium, and it would twist around and fall off your finger. In general, toppling occurs if the center of gravity is not over the base. If you moved your finger over so it was under the center of gravity, then you could balance this thing on your finger. And there are many exercises that we will do with that that are all good exercises. Um, what about this one, in which these two cases would, would uh, you have uh, equilibrium? Uh, no, would you not have equilibrium? Would there be a torque and a tendency to twist? And that's so obvious. Um, I don't think I even put it on your worksheet. But this one here, how far would you have to push this book to the side before you got to the state where, where it would topple? Ah, heavens. There's the answer to the question, isn't it? That this is the one that would be topple, but can you tell me why this would be the one that would topple? I fixed the worksheet. This is a toy that I will show you. And you've got a, a, a doll of a fisherman with, with a fish on the line down here. And the way the doll works is that the center of gravity is below the, the fisherman's feet. And so if you take it and push it to the side, then, then the fisherman moves this way, but this thing moves this way. The center of gravity, which used to be right here, has come up to here when you gave the fisherman a push. And the weight, which acts um, at the center of gravity, would pull down and you would, the normal would act at the base, pushing up. And again, you see that you have a couple here, but a couple which brings the center of gravity back to its equilibrium position. And if you were to rock the fisherman back and he was over here, then, then the fish would be over here. The fisherman would be leaning back. And the center of gravity would be here. And again, you get a couple which brings it back into equilibrium. So, so you have this stability. If instead of having the weight down here, what I will do in class is I will put the weight up at the top on the fisherman's head. And whereas here you have this normal force and the um, weight forming a couple which brings it back into equilibrium here in this case with the weight up high you have the weight and the normal force again forming a couple but this couple tends to make the here will it tends to make the person go this way and he falls off if you have the weight up high. If you have the weight down low, you get a stable equilibrium. Weight up high, you get this unstable equilibrium, which is exactly the point of this image. If you have an equilibrium that the normal force and the weight are lined up and everything's in equilibrium, and you move slightly away from the equilibrium, and that results in a torque or force which takes you further away from your equilibrium position, we call this an unstable equilibrium. Whereas here, if you move slightly away from your equilibrium position, you get a force that brings you back to that equilibrium position. So this would be a stable equilibrium. And this would be called a neutral equilibrium. If you move slightly away from that equilibrium position, 
there is neither force that pushes you away nor is there force that pushes you back. So we call that a neutral equilibrium. Thank you and have a good evening.